Good morning and welcome. It's really nice to have all of you with us here in this virtual meeting hosted by the Nordic Testbed Network. A network aiming to support the digital transformation within the Nordic bioeconomy. Today we will discuss data management and a whole range of different questions associated with the opportunities and the challenges that we face with big data. We will talk about large European initiatives such as the European Open Science Source and Gaia-X. But we will also talk about the specific issues and challenges that our testbed members are facing in terms of data management as we speak. And we will touch upon some peculiarities, for example the similarities between open data and renewable energy, and why it might be interesting turning to NHL and sports statistics when working with connected cows. My name is Maria Thunberg. I am guiding you through this virtual meeting here today. And I'm affiliated researcher at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences and also work within the telecom industry. So I have one foot within the bioeconomy and one foot within the world of digitalization. And that's an interesting intersection. So what is the purpose of today then? Well, I have two objectives that I would like to have reached by 12 o'clock today. So I would like all of us to feel inspired so that we leave here two hours from now and feel inspired and with some positive energy and also some new knowledge about data management. And in order to reach these two objectives, we have pulled together an agenda for you today. So after some welcoming words and also a brief talk and explanation about what the Nordic Testbed Network is, because I know we have some new participants in the meeting here today that might not know exactly what the network is aiming to achieve. So after those words, we will then move on to or into one of our test beds. So I'm very happy to announce that we have Shasti Balkevem with us from Nibio's Center for Precision Agriculture. And Shasti will talk about some of the very exciting initiatives that's being run at this testbed and also some of the challenges that they are facing in terms of data management. We will then move into our keynote lecture for today and I'm very happy to say that we have Suzanne Dumochel with us here today. And Suzanne is working in a range of different large European data management initiatives. For example, the European Open Science Cloud. We will then have a short break and after that we will move into a panel conversation. So I will be happy to invite Wahad Graeber Saudri, who is a commercial lawyer and specialized within research data management from a legal point of view. And I will also talk to Thomas Klingström, who's representing the GigaCow testbed within the network, and Erik Villén, who's representing the Auto2 testbed. So I think that will be a very interesting conversation, and I'm looking forward to that. And after the panel conversation, we will move into a more of an interactive session of this virtual meeting. Because we wanted to provide you with an opportunity to engage in discussions in smaller groups and networking. So we have prepared five different breakout rooms, as it is called within Zoom, with five different topics. So we have one for business models, we have one for technical requirements, one for data ethics, one for decision making, and a final one for data sharing. So five different topics, but all centered around data management. So you could already now, if you like, have a think of which of these rooms would you like to join? Is there any specific conversation you would like to join? And we hope that you see this as an opportunity to share your knowledge and ideas, to listen in, and perhaps to find some new contacts for future collaborations. And by 12 o'clock, we will end this meeting for today. And the meeting is recorded and it will later be posted on the website for the network. But we will not share the individual presentations of the speakers today, but rather encourage you to look at the recording. And I would also like to uh, say that please use the chat function. So if there's any comments you'd like to provide, then please use that chat. And also, if there's any questions for the speakers, 
the chat is a good place to place those uh, and I will try to pick them up in a matter of time. So this slide is full of information and the purpose is not for you to see every detail. The purpose with this slide is for you to see the whole sort of range and variety and the number of people who are in this seminar today. Because I'm very happy that we have all this expertise in this virtual room today. I think that's quite exciting. And also showing you this slide gives you an opportunity within the recording then later have a look at who's actually participating. But just having a quick overview, I can see that we have researchers from different Nordic universities, but also from other universities. I know we have Wageningen University represented here today. And we have larger firms like Ericsson and Sony, but we also have small growing firms like Vultus and Animal AI. And we have a range of public organizations such as Innovationsgoana and also representatives from the Nordic Council of Ministers. But I don't want to stay there because I'm really quite curious about all of you who chose to join this meeting today. So I have prepared this Menti exercise, which I hope you will like to do with me. So if you could please enter this website, www.menti.com, and then enter the code you see here on the slide. It's 67252880. You will be faced with two different questions. What kind of organization do you represent being here today? And where are you based? So I would like to encourage you to enter that website. And meanwhile, I would change over to the Menti page so that I can show you the result of all your answers. So I will switch over to the Menti and we will see who we actually have with us here in the meeting today. It's always quite interesting to see who is participating. So here we can see that we have some representing the private sector. We also have the public here, as I mentioned. And let's see if we can get a few more answers to get an idea of sort of the, the division between these different sectors here in the meeting today. You can also see here at the top of the page that you can enter, as I said, menti.com. And then you have this a uh, specific code that you have to enter 67252880. This is also quite interesting for us as documentation from the, from the webinar. Who are we actually reaching out to? Who finds this kind of virtual meetings interesting? So quite a few researchers, I think, that we have with us here today, uh, but indeed both private and public sector. Uh, it's ticking in more and more uh, answers here. Uh, I also have this second question uh, and that is, let's see if we can switch over to the next one to see sort of where are you based? I know we have a lot of different Nordic participants, no one from Iceland today, oh, that's a shame. But we do have quite a few from Sweden, we have Finland here, some from Norway, oh, that's a few more Norwegians. And we also have quite a few others. I know we have, for example, from Latvia, a few uh, people participating. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I think it's quite interesting to get at least a brief understanding of who we have here in the meeting. And I look forward to the interactive session later on to be able to get into discussion with some of you. So I will now go back to my presentation and thank you so much for sharing uh, where you are based and what you are working with. So let's see if we can come back to the presentation. There we go. So just a few words then on what is this all about? What is the Nordic Testbed Network and what do we aim to do? Well, the absolute core is to unite and strengthen testbeds that are already existing within the Nordic region and testbeds that are themselves working with supporting the digital transformation of the bioeconomy. And a few years back, we set a vision for 2023, and that is to co-create solutions for the digital bioeconomy. And that's also why we want to provide you with opportunity to interact and share contact and find new people that you would like to collaborate with. 
And one of the milestones for this year is to increase the no uh, knowledge sharing between test beds uh, active within this sector. And I will soon come back to another milestone that we have for this year, which is very exciting. But I also want to touch upon some of the core concepts, um, because these are quite wide and big terms that we are working with. We have bioeconomy, we have digitalization, we have testbed, and each one of them are sort of quite challenging to understand what it's actually about. But from our point of view, so from the Nordic Testbed Network's point of view, we see bioeconomy as the forestry sector, as the agriculture sector, and as the fishery and aquaculture sector. So that's our take on the bioeconomy within this network. And when talking about digitalization, we see it as a large structural change process that is ongoing and that we need to relate to. So for example, digitization is about going from analog to digital, but digitalization in this uh, context is about creating new business models, uh, system level innovations and new infrastructure solutions, for example, that are enabled by the development and the deployment of digital technology. And test beds then. What is a test bed? That's a challenging one. But what we say here, and we lean on some of the Swedish authorities' definition of test beds, and that it, that it should be a physical or a virtual environment, but which is open. So where business, acad academia and other type of organizations can come together and co-create solutions. And typically it could include, of course, both hardware and software. And to provide some examples then, we have a range of very exciting test beds within the network already. And here I give you some examples. And please have a look at our website to learn more about these different test beds. But for example, we have digitalized agriculture based in uh, outside of Uppsala in Sweden. We also have, for example, GigaCow, which we will have represented in the panel discussion later on. We have the Aarhus Center for Smart Farming as an example, and Oluson in Finland working with large machinery and autonomous machinery. So that's, I think, a very interesting range of different kind of test beds. So please have a look at all of those. And if you're representing a test bed, or if you think that maybe you're representing a test bed in accordance with our definition, please get in contact because we are very interested in getting to know you and getting you involved in the network if you like. Now I would like to invite Jonas Rönnberg, who is heading Nordic Forest Research and overarching responsible both for SNS and for Nordic Agri Research. Uh, I'm curious, Jonas, how come that you're supporting this testbed network? Why do you think that's important to work with these issues, digitalization in the bioeconomy? Thank you very much, Maria. Yes, well, maybe first a few words on what, what, what we are. Uh, but um, very first, most welcome to everyone. And it's really nice to see that we're quite a few here, actually. And I'm also looking forward to hear about the sporty cows. Um, well, SNS and NKJ are uh, secretariats uh, hosted by SLU right now, but we're sorting under the Nordic Council of Ministers, uh, collaborative units for, for those respective areas. Um, uh, we have a secretariat, uh, a joint secretariat at uh, in Alnarp, actually at SLU, close to Copenhagen as well, and close to uh, Norgen or the Nordic Research uh, Resource Center. Um, we, we are a you can say science to policy interface. Um, we produce knowledge uh, with Nordic added value. We stimulate networking. Um, we also uh, work a lot with uh, strategic projects of which this uh, um, uh, uh, test and network is, is one. Um, and, and of course, in all this communication is also very, very important. Um, when it comes to uh, specifically digitalization, well, it continues to be of a particular interest uh, within uh, not the least the Nordic countries. And, and as such, we have had uh, um, uh, special uh, wishes from our ministers in the, in the different countries on developing this area, as well as, of course, uh, the connection to the bioeconomy and climate change. 
So yes, this is of utmost importance for, for all of us. Um, in in the, the work now, I can also add that we have a new bioeconomy program uh, that will be started any day. Uh, and uh, within that, we will also work with this uh, Nordic test by network. So I can already now tell you that there will be additional funding coming in to, um, to the network uh, for which we need to, to find the best use uh, of that. It's also very nice to, to, to uh, um, say that to tell you that uh, we, we have the blue side on board. Um, and that's really nice. And I think that we will hear some more about that. But um, um, before I end, um, um, I also would like to, to, to let you know, since we have quite a few uh, researchers here uh, and also other stakeholders that could be interested in the calls that are um, either out now or will come out during um, the summer here. For, for applications so that the, the, it's a, if, you, if you have a good idea and you have some colleagues in the Nordic countries, you can also apply for, for some specific network money also from, from, the, from those calls. Um, anyway, um, it's really nice to see you all here. Uh, this is as important for us because we're learning from you, we get inspired and, and, and we, we find new ways of, of moving this network forward. Thanks to, to, for, to all of you for joining, uh, and thanks also, to, to, of course, to the organizers and the, and the coming speakers. Looking forward to that. Okay, thank you, Maria. Thank you so much, Jonas, for that. And, and thank you for introducing us here to my next slide, actually, which is on the blue bioeconomy. Because just as Jonas mentioned, we have this exciting news that from 2021 and onwards, we also have fishery and, and aquaculture as part of this network. Uh, so that's one of the milestones for this year to include the blue bioeconomy and we will kick off or we're already working on sort of mapping who are the interesting stakeholders when looking at the blue side of the bioeconomy. And I here also want to take the opportunity to, if you have knowledge about an exciting blue bioeconomy testbed or if you're working at one, please get in contact. And on that note, I would also like to invite Helge Polsen, who is here then representing the Blue Bioeconomy. So working as a project coordinator at the Nordic Council of Minister with especially then fisher and agriculture. Welcome Helge and please say a few words on why did you choose to um, support this network? Yeah, thank you Maria. And thank you for to welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to be in here. I'm uh, Helge Paulsen representing the Nordic Fisheries uh, Collaboration. And we have recently joined the, the TESPED uh, network because we see a, a great potential in, in that collaboration. The Fisheries uh, Collaboration uh, aims to promote Nordic collaboration in the fisheries sector in general. The fisheries is, is uh, characterized uh, by being very uh, energy and, and labor intensive. And there is a high potential to, to optimize uh, uh, all uh, elements in the related to fisheries and, and aqua, aquaculture. Just uh, think about the, the cost it, it, and the labor it takes to sail uh, in, in the sea with large ships or fishing boats, the energy which is used and, and stuff uh, necessary. And what can be achieved by using, for example, low technology to, to, to gather information. These things we would like to, to, uh, to uh, work on to improve and, and to improve the Nordic collaboration to, uh, specifically in, in, in this area. The Nordic Fisheries uh, Collaboration, we support activities primarily in the form of what increases collaboration. That is workshops, it's conferences, it's general networking, it's uh, formation of groups with the aim to, to uh, make larger applications to international grants, for example, from the, from the EU. And also in doing uh, analysis work and, and uh, reports on, on topics which, which are relevant uh, for, for development of the fishery sector. We only support to a minor extent uh, actual research and, and uh, innovation work. But we want to support 
the, the collaboration needed to achieve these things. So just if you have the need, have ideas for activities where we could help you to join together with all the other Nordic participants in topics uh, that will promote and develop uh, fisheries and, and blue, uh, the, the blue sector, then I think you should contact us. And that can be done either you can consult the, the Norden.org, which is the homepage of the Nordic Council of Ministers, or you can go to, to the Nordic Testbed uh, organization or the website, and there you can find us. We, we uh, collect uh, proposals for, for projects uh, three times a year, and uh, we, uh, we generally have around 40 projects running, and uh, we are, you are welcome also if you have some good ideas. So I look forward to hear what, what uh, you are working with and, and uh, what's going to happen today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helge, and uh, I hope that if you're interested and you have some great ideas here with regards to the fisheries sector, then get in contact with Helge and the Nordic Council of Ministers Working Group for Fishery and Aquaculture. A few words then on sort of who can join the Nordic Testbed Network. Basically, we're interested in getting in contact with anyone who's interested in the digital transformation of the Nordic bioeconomy. But the network members themselves then need to be test beds according to the definition that I just laid out. Um, and if, if you have any questions or uh, uh, thoughts about this, then just get in contact and we can have a conversation and a meeting and dig into these questions. And also perhaps just to touch upon the benefits as we see it to be part of the network. And that is, as we have heard both from Jonas and Helge here, mainly to get in contact with others, very skilled and experienced people within the same topics as you're interested in. And I just want to highlight here that joining the network is free of charge. And uh, so these webinars, the newsletters, other events that we are arranging are all free for the participants to join. But now I think it's definitely time to move into the first speaker for today. Uh, and I'm very happy that we have Chesty with us here. And I look forward, Chesty, to learn a little bit more about some of the initiatives that you are running at the Nibio Center for Precision Agriculture, and also more specifically, the challenges as you see it in terms of data management. So most welcome, Chesty, the word is yours. Hi, good morning. So my name is Shashti, as you said, and I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to present our thoughts regarding the for today's webinar. Um, I work in Nibio, which is the Norwegian Institute for Bioeconomics, where I am in charge of our Center for Precision Agriculture. Uh, I will put our perspectives into the context of one of the projects that we are working on currently at the Center, and this project is called Tesis. It started in 2019 and will last for five years. So what we are doing in this project, project is that we are creating a agricultural mapping service where farmers, farmers can uh, process sensor data collected from their fields to get in, for instance, a yield map or an application map for herbicides or fertilizers in return. Um, the modeling uh, and the recommendations given by the service is based on previous research results as well as new work performed within the project. We focus primarily on grassland and wheat, but we may expand into other crops as we move along. And we do a lot of field trials to verify that the models actually give correct results and that they are calibrated to large Norwegian farming regions. The goal is to create a, a free base service for uh, any Norwegian farmer who wants it. Shirti, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but your sound is a little bit low. Is it possible for you just to speak up a little bit? I think maybe the mic we tested earlier is not the one you're using now. So maybe uh, is, it better, is it better now? That's much better. Thank you, Shirti. Yeah, I, it was just, uh, I had moved it a bit away from my face. I'm sorry. Um, should I repeat anything or uh, I think it's could you fine. hear me? You can just go on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what I said, the goal is to create a free base uh, service for any Norwegian farmer who wants it, but we may also 
uh, make a premium solution which requires some payment, but the details for this remain to be decided still. The service will have a web-based user interface, which is integrated with a Norwegian agricultural information service called goshkart.no, which is also managed by Nibio. Uh, and the farmers will have full ownership of their own data that they upload. Um, so uh, a lot of data will be handled and processed within Precis when it is up and running. And this illustration shows the data flow in the service. So first, um, data is collected by the farmer or someone who is contracted by the farmer. And this can be done via either a, a UAV or a satellite or a sensor mounted on a tractor. This data is then uploaded, uploaded via the web interface uh, to our servers where it is processed. And the user um, defines which fields it wants the service to be for and uh, which service it uh, he wants for each field. So then when the processing is complete, the uh, user can download the result or the service product that we, as we refer to it, and can use it uh, in the systems, uh, the other systems that the farmer has. This can be, for instance, a, a farm management information system, or it can be to control tractor implements, such as um, a fertilizer or herbicide sprayer. So that means that it's really important that our service is compatible with these information systems and or uh, implements in order to make the system useful and versatile and suitable for all interested users. Uh, and therefore it has to handle a lot of data formats, both as input and output. And some of these data formats are not openly accessible. Um, so as we see it, there are two main challenges. And the first is um, interoperability and standard formats, or maybe I could say interoperability restrictions and lack of common data standards. This hinders implementation of precision agriculture. It may lock the farmer into one system, which again leads to competition issues. And even if you have the ISO bus as the main com communication line in the tractor, that's really nice, but uh, if the act actors or um, equipment at each end of the line speak different languages, then it doesn't really help that much. Uh, and the second challenge that we see is uh, data ownership, who owns the data, uh, who benefits from the data and who decides uh, which, in which ways the data can be used. In our project, the farmer owns the data uh, so, so if the farmer collects the data herself, she will definitely own the data, but we don't, we can't control what happens in agreements between, for instance, the farmer and someone who collects the data for the farmer. Um, so we think that it's important that these issues are addressed and that common solutions and data formats are adopted. This would be a benefit to the farmer as well as to many companies, and it would also benefit those of us working within research. Um, I know there has been some initiatives and that there are initiatives going on, but I don't think there is anything that is really widely adopted yet. So yeah, I think that's what I was planning to say. So if anyone has any questions, then please go ahead. Thank you so much, Chastia. I think that thank you so much, Chastia. I think that's very interesting. Um, I heard you mention here at the end both the sort of the challenge with interoperability, but also in terms of who owns the data. And and I have a question here. You said that it's the farmer who has access to the data. How is that working in practice? I mean, how do you ensure that it's only the farmer that accesses that data? Uh, well, when the farmer uh, uses this uh, goshkart.no, this web-based interface that we use, um, she can log in using uh, um, identification called bank ID. Uh, this is a common identification method used in Norway, which meets the official Norwegian requirements that applies to identity verification and binding electronic signature. It is used for many public services and also for all banks in Norway. So uh, it's a personal logon that only uh, the user use and can only act the only when it's logged in, it's only this user who can access the data. Then we also 
uh, want to make it possible for the user to share data with others, such as advisors. And we would also like to ask for consent so that uh, in the case that the farmer consents to it, then we can use the data for research. But it's this will be completely up to the farmer to decide. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shasti. I, I know also in Sweden we use the bank ID, so uh, that I can relate to what you're saying there. I also have a question from, from the audience, Shasti, um, picking up here from the chat. So, uh, uh, Henrike is asking, do you also use soil sensors for temperature and humidity, etc., and weather data as input to the farmers? Uh, within this project, we are not doing that, but um, it it could be implemented in the future. I know there are other projects that uh, may look into to this, but we are not currently working with soil sensors uh, in the work we do at uh, my center. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, if anyone wants to get in contact with Chesty, you find her at Nibio Center for Precision Agriculture. Thank you so much, Jesty, for sharing reflections from a test bed. I would then like to continue in the agenda for today and move on to Suzanne de Mochel. We are very happy to have you with us today, Suzanne. Uh, I know you're working in a range of different European initiatives, and I look forward to get an explanation to some of these very long and tricky names. But I know that you're working with different research infrastructures on the European level and also in this European Open Science Cloud, which we are very curious about. Uh, so most welcome, Susan, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm very, uh, very pleased to, to be there with you and uh, to learn a lot also from the, the TASPED network, uh, which I didn't know uh, uh, before. So um, I'd like to um, to share um, some some view, some uh, suggestion, or yeah, some some points on the why should we care about data, and um, I hope I can um, then open to uh, to indeed the, the European Open Science Cloud and uh, and a bit to uh, Gaia X. So just to introduce a bit myself, so I'm a research engineer at uh, CNRS. I'm a um, coordinator of uh, a, res a European research infrastructure entitled OPRAS, dedicated to open scholarly communication in the field of the social science and humanities. And I'm uh, currently uh, part of the board of directors of the uh, European Open Science Cloud uh, Association since uh, last uh, December. So let's uh, let's start uh, with this uh, with this proposition. Why why should we care about data? Um, sorry, yeah, yeah. So let's uh, let's tell us why why it's important to speak about data. The first thing is, have you ever lost uh, data in your own computer? How many of us were in trouble if the uh, computer broke down? How many of us uh, can be in trouble if the USB stick uh, got lost or stolen? Uh, and that means that the backup something that we were all discussing before uh, was is now another way uh, we have now other way to to back up the data uh, we produce in our uh, daily uh, activities so what is data uh, we also have to to uh, to be uh, to agree on this on this word so data uh, so it can be a table here with a lot of uh, a lot of different uh, number it can be a picture or an event depending on how you interpret uh, this, uh, this picture. Uh, it can be a poem, an old poem. It can be a schema. It can be an object. It can be an event. It can be so very uh, picture, uh, uh, yeah, very video, uh, other schema, and so on. So it can be a lot of things. Uh, and this is here to highlight the diversity, uh, as mentioned by uh, Wolfram Hausmann in the in the tweet. Uh, data diversity, uh, like something that we do in a biodiversity. And this is something which is uh, highly important to understand what is the data. Another kind of words that can be used is the output, especially in science, we can mention the research output uh, instead of uh, the data, but we know that uh, data is the most uh, used uh, one. So how to define, how we can define uh, data. So we can they, they define data. So it's in the humanities, but actually it's, it works for uh, the different kind of science. 
as all materials and assets scholars collect, generate and use during all stages of the research cycle. In this report, so in the ALIA 2020 report, there is this focus on digital assets, which is today uh, the, the one on which we are more uh, working. So data, to, uh, we, we can ag agree on this kind of definition that data is all materials and assets collected, generated, and used during the research uh, cycle. So let's come back to the title of the, the presentation, why should we care about data? So as I said uh, previously, not to lose them, uh, but also because when data uh, is organized, uh, then the research itself is more efficient. You can produce better uh, results. Some kind of data are unique events, such as in meteorology or seismology. So it's important to keep track of them to allow for checks and validation by the rest of the uh, society, the research uh, community, to improve the research integrity, to be re reproducible, that means reusable also uh, by other uh, researchers. If the data uh, is open, uh, it can play a crucial role in finding vaccines, and I think we all understand in this uh, uh, global, ecosystem, global context that we are uh, facing uh, for more than a year. If the data is open, it can uh, booster or foster collaboration. It allows reuse. So uh, as said by uh, Roberto Pollock, the coolest thing to do with your data uh, will be thought of by someone else. So this is why it's also important to care about data, to improve uh, the reusability of them, and also to, uh, to facilitate or to foster uh, innovation in science, but not only as I will uh, present uh, a bit later. So data, uh, as mentioned by the World Economic Forum in 2012, data creates a bridge between traditional disciplines, spawning discovery and innovation from the humanities to the hard science. Data dissolves barriers, opening up new channels of communication, lines of research, and commercial opportunities. Data will be the engine, the spark to create a better world for all. So the last sentence is maybe a bit uh, here to, uh, yeah, to, um, uh, to welcome us to, to work more on data, but at least the, the first part, uh, the, the, most of the part of this, uh, uh, of this paragraph is really interesting and is completely uh, true uh, in terms of creating bridge, dissolving barriers, and opening up new channel of communication, collaboration, and also commercial uh, opportunities. So data are, can be used, uh, can allow for interdisciplinary uh, research to tackle global uh, challenges. And this is where uh, we have now the European Open Science Cloud, and this is this is exactly why, uh, because of this need of data, uh, we've been not obliged, but we've been pushed uh, to uh, create more interoperability and more collaboration between all the different actors in in science and with the research community, uh, in order to have seamless access uh, to open by the default the fair data. So this is where come uh, the European Open uh, Science Cloud with this very uh, important aim to provide all researchers in Europe seamless access to uh, open by default, efficient and cross-disciplinary environment for storing, accessing, reusing and processing research data supporting by the fair data principle. And this was something mentioned by the uh, European Commission President, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, when she uh, talks about, she presented the European Open Science Cloud in uh, the Davos, uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos. And what she highlighted is that 85% of data are never used. This is not sustainable, and this is why we need uh, the European Open Science Cloud, in order to be sure that the data that, that are produced can be used and reused and bring to a better uh, innovation, fostering the quality of science. So to build uh, to build uh, the EOSCs, uh, no, not really to build the EOSCs, but to um, the building blocks of the European Open Science Cloud uh, are the FAIR data. So FAIR is for findable, uh, which is a way to reduce the, the loss risk uh, and uh, to, to, to save time. 
uh, accessible. That, that means that data are, is available in the future, interoperable to uh, foster interdisciplinarity and collaboration, and reusable, avoid uh, funding duplication and creating trust, and also maximize, of course, the return on uh, investment. So about the EOSC association, so context of building the European Open Science Cloud, a specific uh, instrument has been uh, created last year in July uh, 2020. Uh, it's the uh, European Open Science Cloud Association with this uh, general mission uh, to advance open science to accelerate the creation of new knowledge, inspire education, spur innovation, and promote accessibility and transparency. So the goal is really to provide a single voice for advocacy and representation for the broader European Open Science Cloud stakeholder community. So this is where also uh, you, we can work together to produce better data and better services to have interoperable uh, data and fair data. So the OSC Association has, uh, is an ISBL, an international association under the uh, Belgium law, uh, formed in July 2020, uh, by uh, four funding members. And now we have uh, more or less, uh, I think it's 137, something like that, members of the European Open Science Cloud uh, um, Association and 49 or approximately something like that, uh, observer of the, uh, of the association. So it's really uh, the place uh, where you can engage by uh, creating uh, collaboration, working on the, the needs uh, you, you face uh, in managing uh, the data. So the, 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 the association is supervised by a board of directors composed of eight director and a president that you have uh, our uh, picture uh, here. But fair data are not only for research. Uh, and this is something which is, uh, I think, particularly interesting, uh, especially in your context, uh, where I think you are at the crossroad between research and industry or society. Uh, regarding what I uh, understand so far uh, of the focus of the uh, of the Nordic uh, testbed network. Uh, so yeah, fair data is also useful for uh, industry uh, because research data is rarely leveraged uh, beyond its original purpose. So uh, it's also important to work on fair data uh, for the industry. Uh, often there is a lack of findability for industry and uh, every element has potential innovative clues. So there is this benefits for industry. And this is why we arrive now to the uh, very general overview of uh, GAIA-X. So GAIA-X is an other initiative, it's an other ISBL, so International Association under the Belgium Law, gathering uh, research uh, organization, but more industrial organization or commercial uh, private company uh, which are a for-profit uh, organization to build, uh, such as the EOSC, um, global ecosystem for sharing uh, services, data, uh, in order to uh, secure and facilitate the reuse of the data that are produced in these uh, companies. Um, I can already mention that there are uh, some a couple of, um, of um, events planned commonly between the European Open Science Cloud Association and the GAIA-X initiative in order to work together and see uh, how we can um, uh, share our uh, common um, uh, perspective and the architecture of our two uh, ecosystem instead of uh, duplicate uh, the effort. So the purpose of GAIA-X is to create a modern, competitive, next generation data and infrastructure uh, ecosystem it shall connect centralized and decentralized infrastructure in order to facilitate uh, here again uh, interoperability uh, of the digital uh, ecosystem. Um, it aims also to strengthen the ability to both access and share data securely and confidently and to provide a strong foundation for the European strategy for data in order to create and secure the sovereignty of uh, the data. So I just put here some examples of the use cases uh, that are developed uh, within the GAIA-X uh, association. Uh, I think that some of them can be uh, might be interested for you. Uh, so if you are interested, then I uh, I encourage you to to contact directly the GAIA-X association or the GAIA-X pub uh, in the Nordic country, as I guess you 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 have uh, one uh, you have one. 
so in terms of use case, you have some in uh, one in energy, in agriculture, agrigaya, uh, several, uh, a lot of uh, use cases in health, uh, some others in uh, industry 4.0 and uh, small and medium enterprise. And you have some others in mobility, smart living and finance. So it's interesting to see how you can, um, in this, uh, in the Gaia X Association, you can create a new use case or join some uh, already existing in order to uh, uh, um, share on uh, on the, your expertise and uh, identify the, the needs uh, you might have. So very quickly, an overview uh, between the differences uh, between uh, the EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud, and the Gaia X Initiative. So in terms of aim, uh, you see that uh, the EOSC aim to create an open science commons and better exchange of fair data. Gaia X is more to build a trusted sovereign digital infrastructure for Europe. Both are more or less uh, coverage uh, of uh, this geographical coverage on Europe and potentially uh, associated countries. Uh, they are both focus on data, but more research data and digital objects for the EOSC and industrial data for Gaia X. But you can understand very easily that uh, some data uh, can be both. The primary target groups are as well a bit different, even if there are uh, already some uh, collaboration. The research on one side for the EOSC and some specific industrial domain uh, for Gaia X. Uh, both have the same legal construction and they are a federation of uh, infrastructure, even if it's not the same kind of infrastructure. And uh, they have been created more or less in the same uh, at the same time, 2020 or end of two, or 2021 for uh, the uh, you know for both actually. So I think that's it. Uh, let's conclude with the value of data. So open data is like a renewable energy source. It can be reused without diminishing its original value, and reuse creates new uh, value, as mentioned in the state of open data in the digital science report in 2027. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, tw uh, 17, sorry, 2017. So I'd like to thank you all for your uh, attention and I'm very pleased to uh, take some questions uh, if there are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I think that was uh, very interesting. You explained to us what data is and why we should care about data. And you also gave us some introduction both to the European Open Science Cloud and the Gaia X and here by the end providing sort of differences and similarities between these two initiatives. I, I found that very useful. And also you talked about the fair data, so findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Um, I, I was wondering, from the, from the perspective, Susan, of the European Open Science Cloud, which is the most sort of pressing issues that you're working with now? What is next on your agenda? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, there are a lot, uh, <laughs> uh, because the, 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 yeah, the ambition is quite, uh, it's quite high. The ambition is quite high. Uh, I would say that the, the most pressing one for, at least to me, uh, is to engage with the community of researchers. Uh, yet we put a lot of effort in terms of creating uh, interoperable services, uh, how to share the data, uh, building uh, standards uh, for the sharing and the reusing of data. Uh, but now we need to have users of those services and, uh, and this is the, the next step and uh, one of the most important one if we want to be sure to have a successful European Open Science Cloud. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I also have some questions from, from the audience. I will pick up some here from the chat for you. Uh, I have one question uh, that reads, how do you address the wide diversity in current attitudes and practices of sharing research data between different scientific disciplines? Do you have any reflection on that, Susan? Do you find that there's different attitudes depending on the research discipline? And if so, how do you manage that? That's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure it's really depending on the attitudes coming from the discipline. It's more the general comprehension we have of what is data. Uh, I can give a very concrete example. As I'm, uh, I, I come from the social science and humanities uh, domain, 
And uh, we have this kind of issue uh, with this term uh, data because uh, sometimes it covers the publication, for instance, even the preprint or things like that. And sometimes so for some other discipline, uh, data is not, uh, is not um, uh, including uh, publication. So it's more something like that, agreeing on uh, the vocabulary and the language we speak in the different domains. And uh, it's, I would say it's more something we, we should be uh, be sure that we share, and this is something I, I also mentioned uh, yesterday at the uh, conference on uh, international conference on research infrastructure. That uh, to build the collaboration and to foster uh, interdisciplinarity, uh, we have to uh, agree on common uh, vocabulary before. And I hope I answer uh, to the question. Yeah, thank you. I understand that the common vocabulary is key. And uh, as I understand that, that's also sort of how you started off your presentation here, talking about the common definition uh, of data. Uh, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, that was very interesting and I hope uh, useful for many of us to understand these different European initiatives and how they connect to each other. Uh, and also hopefully getting people inspired to learn some more about uh, GaiaX, for example, if you're an industry uh, representative here today. But thank you so much, Susanne. Thank I you. appreciate you taking the time here today. Thanks. We will now take a short break uh, for everyone to get a cup of coffee or whatever you need. Uh, and we will meet back in five minutes. So it's now 10.53 and I would like to welcome you all back in five minutes. We will uh, kick off with the next part of the webinar, which is the panel conversation, which I will engage in together with Ohad, Thomas and Eric. So you're most welcome back in five minutes. Welcome back. I hope you all got a chance to get a bit of fresh air or a coffee or whatever you needed. I know it's the very sunny and nice weather in many parts of the Nordic region today. And I know at least a few people who just installed solar panels and who are extra happy today and looking at the, the sun hitting the roof of the house. So welcome back and we will now uh, join into a panel conversation with three participants and I'm very happy to say that we have Eric Villén who is here today representing uh, Auto2 uh, Testbed, working with machinery, autonomous machinery for the forestry sector. Uh, we also have Ohad Graber Saudri with us, who is a commercial lawyer working with research data from a legal point of view. And then we have Thomas Klingstöm, who is representing the GigaCow testbed, working with uh, very simplified connected cows. I'm sure Thomas will guide us through exactly what, what GigaCow is working on at the moment. But you're most welcome, all three of you, Eric, Ohad and Thomas. And let's see if we can get you all in video mode so that can we, we can see all three of you. And there we have you. Great to have you. I would like to start off with a question to you, Ohad, um, because I'm thinking of with your experience of working with research infrastructures and research performing organizations, what are the main legal aspects uh, when talking about data management? If you could talk us through that in a, in a brief sort of comment, that would be great. Sure. Uh, just, to, just to begin with, to say it's a really pleasure to be here today and uh, to thank you once again for the invitation uh, to speak with you. Um, as you mentioned, I am the, I'm the director of Ex Officio. I'm a lawyer and Ex Officio is a law firm based in Lund in Sweden. And the vast majority of our clients are actually research performing organizations, universities and research infrastructures. So we, we work, we very much focused on the, this type of issues that usually uh, the, the science community at large is dealing with and data is, is one of them, obviously many others issues as well, uh, including governance and questions and contracts. But in terms of data, I'm really, I'm really happy that uh, the term interoperability has been mentioned in the two previous sessions. And that's quite key to understand um, actually what is the uh, European Open Science Cloud for, uh, and also to understand some of the legal issues concerned. 
when we talk about interoperability, there are actually all several kinds of interoperability. Those who are familiar with the concept will know that probably the technical or the semantic or the organizational, but there's also legal interoperability. And the legal issues, and what I'd like to say a few words now is about the legal issues concerned with legal interoperability, which in simple words is, is, is the access to the sharing and the reuse of data. And that is the key to understand is how is reusing data. And that's where some of the legal problems uh, are more visible, even though they exist also in, in other uh, you know, data related issues, uh, uh, considerations or use. But when we're reusing data, one of the issue, uh, I would just say there are many issues, as I said, but I could just highlight four issues very briefly. And one of them is the issue which was referred to previously as ownership. But when we speak about ownership uh, in data, uh, we usually speak about copyright. Now, not all data is copyrightable. Data is, in principle, is not something which is copyrightable, meaning that has any intellectual property rights connected with it. But when the data is actually has a certain degree of of, of let's say um, some some creativity related with the data, either in the form which is this, it is described or in the form which is presented, or in many other ways, then the issue of copyright may arise. And the question is, how do we reuse the data without breaching a copyright of someone else, of let's say the owner of the data? And for that purpose. When we speak about research data, uh, we assume that we are sharing the data and it is available for use by, by some others. Uh, and we have to be careful about the copyright if, if some of the data is copyrightable, and then we have to look very carefully what license has been assigned to the data. And that works both ways, both when we share data, which is copyrightable, we want to assign the correct license to the data. It could be an open license, such as Creative Commons, uh, but we want to make sure that we choose the right one. And if we reuse the data and let's say combine it with a different set of data and then create a derivative data of these two, two or more sets, we would like to make sure that we don't breach any of the licenses or the copyright that are assigned to part could be a part of the data. It could even be an image, image in the data, uh, in a, in a non-copyrightable data. But if it contains an image or a diagram or something which was has a creative element, then we have to be careful with that. Obviously, that applies also to data database, uh, which is often used to collect data and to present data. There are different type of licenses or rules in relation to database. I will not describe them now, but just to mention that as well. The other point that is uh, not unique to the research data, but is also applies to research data is obviously the GDPR is privacy. And that's another thing that we have to be careful. Data, once again, doesn't mean that there are GDPR issues, but whenever there are personal data involved and personal data is quite broadly defined, uh, then we may have uh, an issue with GDPR. So the, the use of the data can be quite, quite risky from a legal perspective. And we have to be to make sure that we don't breach any of the GDPR requirements. And we also take measures to, uh, to comply with those requirements. Another point that, we, uh, that may become relevant to, to some of us here is in addition to what I've described, is the issue of sensitive data. In some areas, we're dealing with sensitive data. Just to give an example, if it's concerned, for example, endangered species, there are some regulations and some laws and even conventions and international agreements about how to treat uh, such data. It cannot be simply put out there uh, without any, any measures to, to protect some sort of data. Uh, other examples, of course, are uh, national security or export controls rules and so on. So we have to be aware of that as well when we deal with certain type of data. And the last point, without taking too much time, um, is 
the uh, sometimes it's not very intuitive to think about this, but it also has to do with liability. And when we put out certain data out there for use by others, uh, we may want to be sure that uh, we're not subject to any liability that may occur due to uh, to inaccuracies uh, of the data or even misuse or, or, or the data or breach of privacy law con connected with the reuse of the data uh, and so on. Some of the licenses address that issue, some don't. If you want to know more about this, we have uh, ex officio has actually delivered uh, uh, an extensive study for the European for the EOS, the European Open Science Cloud that was mentioned. I can share the link uh, to the study, which really sets out all these issues in very in great detail. Thank you for now. Well, thank, thank you so much, Ahad. Um, I, I learned a new word to start with, copyrightable. That's new in my vocabulary, so thanks for that. Uh, and I also noted that you mentioned these four different areas. So you talked about ownership being one important aspect and that this is where copyrightable came into to use and, and the use of license, for example. And then you talked about GDPR and privacy matters. And then the third point you mentioned was the sensitivity of data. It could be national security, it could be endangered species, for example. And then the final point you mentioned here was the liability, um, potential issues with regards to liability, so inaccuracy or misuse of data somehow. Thank you. I, I think that sets the stage quite neatly. And um, I would like to move on to, uh, to Thomas to ask you, because I know you're working in GigaCow with different legal aspects right now as we speak, really, uh, to give you some examples of, of sort of, do you recognize here what Ohad is talking about? And can you give some more sort of flesh on the bones from the reality here from a, a test bed? What does this look like when we talk about legal issues with regards to, to your kind of Data. Yeah, uh, when, uh, when talking with other bioinformatics researchers, I like to joke that cows don't have GDPR, which really helps with a lot of genetics research. And uh, that, But then, of course, you have the farmers who are protected by GDPR. But that is one of the things that you can easily do, that when you have a stable test bed, then we can deal with that kind of issues. So. Basically, you have the researcher, you have the test bed that ensures that we have traceability, and then you have the farms. So the test bed, so the test bed has a role to play in the personal data protection. And then the big challenge for us is how to protect the different stakeholders' interests. Because since agriculture, everything we do in agriculture when it comes to research is regulated by, by the contracts that we write. We have to be very careful to think about what kind, uh, what kind of business opportunities do we need to protect for the different stakeholders now and in the future. And that is a problem as business models change because basically data is much more valuable nowadays. Thank you. Thank you for that reflection, uh, Thomas. Uh, I definitely took note here that the GDPR doesn't apply to cows. Uh, but but also here that within sort of, if I understand you correctly, Thomas, within the control environment and of a test bed, uh, you can manage these, these issues. Um, and, and you do that through the contractual uh, terms, for example. I also have yes, to... So, but, sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah, basically, I become I become uh, I become the custodian to make sure that we don't leak information. It's uh, because GDPR has caused a lot of structural issues. Like, if you remember last spring, we had this a bit uh, this fiasco where they couldn't validate this. Uh, it was the COVID nineteen samples in hospitals. They couldn't validate that all the samples had been sent correctly from the clinical care to the first statistics collected to see how many people were infected. And that is because they basically anonymized all the data, which meant that it wasn't traceable anymore. And you lost the traceability. Which was a, yeah. So we tried to, we, we, so as a, as a test bed, we can ensure that we have that, that traceability. 
Could, could you also please, Thomas, comment uh, something upon the project that you are initiating or, or, or looking at initiating, where you gather expertise from, from different fields to look at this question? Oh, yes, it's uh, that is when we are we're combined. We're, we have an application now to support the development of artificial intelligence and autonomous systems in agriculture, where we're collaborating between us at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, then Agronod, which is the new data platform for agriculture in Sweden and then Uppsala University, where the Faculty of Law is now starting to work on something called sustainability law, which is a field where they combine health law, environmental law, commercial law and competition law to make sure that we do have the legal frameworks necessary to evaluate business models and implement contracts that support the long term sustainability of the business models. Exciting. So um, I guess within the network, we will be very interested to follow what happens with this application and, and then uh, hopefully uh, what happens in the project uh, that you will be yeah. running. Yeah, with a lot of the contracts we've started writing, then the, then the time between starting talks and actually having a contract in place and getting the data has ta been taking over 12 months. And with better frameworks for this, we might be able to get it down to one or two months. And then, of course, that's for us at the test bed. And then we can pass it on more quickly to researchers afterwards. Well, thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for sharing some reflections and, and knowledge there. Uh, I will definitely get back to you on those sports statistics as well. But first, I would like to turn to Eric, because Thomas here is talking about how how some of these legal issues and, and contractual issues can be managed within the testbed. But I know you also have some reflections, Eric, on what happens when we scale up. So what happens when we move the solutions from the testbed environment to, sort of, to the wider context, which is really what it's aimed for, right? Would you like to share some reflections on that, Eric? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the, for the invitation. Yes, I, firstly, we are talking about our testbeds, how to two relates to the, the data from forest machines. So we can split them perhaps in, 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 into two different kinds, categories. One type of data, data includes data from only from the machines, how well they are working, uh, power usage, uh, the tor how the torch are operated and so on, really technical data. Uh, no GDPR, GDPR issues there. But the scale-up problem is, and they are quite specific, you know, you want to really know what type of study you've done and how to, how to evaluate the data. The tricky part uh, comes to when you include the production data, because this is, then we have an operator involved, uh, meaning GDPR problem. And we also have details about how, how, the, how the production is ongoing, how much you offload or unload on a forest machine, how how fast you're doing each of the cut of the forests and so on and here you include a lot of issues that both include gdp or issues relating to to uh, of course uh, uh, individuals but on top of that you also have like this is production data you know so it's like a data from from uh, that perhaps uh, uh, reveals how a forest company is actually cutting the trees in how they how they uh, how they really want to optimize the use of the timber. So this is quite quite tricky to share, and and uh, this has been a topic for a while. And how how it is really uh, uh, perhaps and 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 this this where well, what's what's on the table now is to find good terms for data sharing. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think. I mean, this is this is private production data, so it's it's, it's probably not let's say, open data. But there are huge possibilities for data sharing because, as you know, uh, in forests, someone cuts the forests, and another industry industry wants to 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 use the the, the, the raw material. So the, there are huge upsides, benefits if you can find ways of of data sharing that perhaps can reveal properties from the wood, from the forest to the industry. And so therefore there's a strong force to, to find out good ways to collaborate and, and to do some data sharing. But of course you also need to, let's say, um, 
prepare the data to let's say remove any 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 information connected to individual individuals for, to to take care of the GDPR data at least when you do the data sharing. But of course, if you want to see how how a team uh, harvest the team is performing, then of course you need to also investigate the differences um, along different operator. So there are so let's say huge uh, also huge possibilities into really understand how well are we performing and how could we uh, improve in our team. So there there are some aspects uh, individuals. In, to summarize, some aspects is learning to, to how to handle data about individuals, uh, uh, but also in a positive way, how, to, how we can improve, but also a way of finding ways for data sharing when we remove information about individuals that can be used from the, let's say, producer to the industry side. That are some reflections I, yeah. I can. Thank, thank you, table. thank you, Eric. Uh, that, that's interesting to hear. And and I would soon like to to move to Ohad again and ask if you have any reflections, Ohad, on on what Eric here is saying about uh, the ownership of data, as I understand it. If it's a, a private company industry owning the data, and then mm. how how can we deal with that? But giving you some time mm. to to think about that, maybe I can just ask you, Eric. When you said data sharing is the important, um, do you then mean from a legal point of view or it's more of a technical point of view, so system alignments and some of the things that Shesti was talking about? Or what's, what's the main issue uh, in terms no, of uh, data sharing? Uh, no, I think that the, when it comes to, to sharing or, or, I mean, if you have, let's say, production data coming from any industry globally, it's, it's, it's rather uncommon that you, let's say, have an open access to the production data. I mean, it would be great if you know exactly the cost of, of, of the furniture at an, an, an IKEA storehouse, but, but, but you don't have that kind of open data. It's a private industry. And the same reflects to, to, to let's say, production data from, from forest companies. It's probably not open data. So that's the thing. Uh, and, and it's been, uh, in, when the digitalization was introduced, people were talking about, let's say, let's share data free and open. And that was also, uh, let's say, hindering the, the ways of finding good ways of data sharing. And data sharing, I mean, the difference here is, of course, that, you, that the one thing is like, say, free and open, and let's see what happens. And the other thing is less something that you actually uh, sign agreements on. Thank you. Thank you for elaborating a bit. And Ohad, any, any reflection from your side when you listen to Eric here? Oh, yeah, oh yes, absolutely. Many, many of them, of course. Um, I, so um, I could speak for, hour, for <laughs> hours on these issues, but I think if I'd have to actually single out one, a couple of points, I would say the following. What Thomas and Eric uh, are speaking about is actually more, we define as more uh, proprietary data meaning that it is actually being used not in the context of open access data, not in the publicly research funded data, but actually data that belongs and has certain commercial value usually. And when we talk about these uh, situations, we usually, you know, you refer to other commercial sensitive data or trade secrets uh, or know-how. And there, of course, the interest is very strong not to reveal, not to share this data, or to share it under specific conditions, uh, the data. Uh, this is not the case with publicly funded research data, for example, being done at university, and then, and then the, the inclination is more to open access. So one interesting, and that is of course, uh, so that is actually what different now from what we've now discussed in this panel and what has been presented by Suzanne, for example, in the presentation, but she has been speaking mainly about, uh, about you know, sharing data she spoke about fair principles, and that's what I'd like to say that maybe that's the link between the proprietary data that has been mentioned now and open access. So fair data does not have to be open. The, uh, the A in fair stands for accessible under well-defined conditions. And here, if we want to take, so when we deal with, coming back to Eric and Thomas, when we deal with proprietary data, no one wants to share the data. They want to use that for their own purposes, usually commercial related purposes. And of course the interest not to share the data is very, very high, but maybe the collective interest to share part of this data is also strong. 
And here where I think fair data comes into play, fair is not open, could be, but doesn't have to be open. And here's a new concept, which is quite important and it's called metadata. Metadata is basically something, is the data that contain a descriptive uh, or contextual and certain provenance assertions of the data which is concerned. The data does not, the metadata simply describes what it is about and can also describe conditions of use. For example, if you want to use certain part of the data, which I, as a company, don't want to be publicly available, I can maybe uh, use, maybe extract, extract some, uh, some commercial, you know, sensitive information from that and say for the other data, you can only use it if you sign an NDA with me or even pay a fee for use the data. But still the metadata that describes these conditions will be out there, could be even on the EOSC. So every person in Europe and in the world could know about this data. Doesn't mean they have access to the data. They will have to comply with certain conditions to access the, the, this data, could even be payment uh, to access the data under certain conditions. And I think coming back to my first point is very important when to, to be clear whether we speak about proprietary data or whether we speak about you know, publicly funded research data, which has other characteristics. So the IP issue is quite important here, but also when I speak about IP, I also include, of course, commercial considerations, know-how and trade secrets. Thank you. That, Thank so that was my, my two cents on that. Of course, there's, uh, there's more to say. Yeah, yeah, I understand. We're just sort of scratching the surface here, but I find it very interesting. And 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 here you also, if I understood you correctly, or had you talked about sort of the 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 me, uh, metadata, uh, so that people could be aware that this data exists, but one then could uh, imagine different ways of accessing it. For example, uh, right. Uh, writing in a non-disclosure agreement or sort of having a license to access some of that data. And, and I think that connects also, I'm thinking, Thomas, of what you've been talking about of sort of these different business models. So is it the farmer that provides this data and then can buy back sort of the solutions that might be created from the data? Or what are your thoughts on that, Thomas? Uh, well, we have two different, well, two different questions to think about here. One is the concept of uh, when it comes to open data, because one of the one of the key things that we're doing in both GigaCow and also and also with this grant application is that we are looking at the equivalent of in pharmacology we have something called pre-competitive phase, which means that you do biological research and share the data between pharm pharmaceutical companies that are competing with each other. And uh, what we're looking at a lot now in GigaCow is what data is business secrets and what data can be released publicly and become open data. Like for example, the genotypes of the cow, they are not a commercially sensitive, see, they are not commercially sensitive. And it's not a privacy issue either since they're cows. So that means that we can release genetic information. We can probably, this is one of the things we're researching, we can probably release genetic information about our dairy cows and information about traits for the animals that we have measured ourselves within the giga cow day, within the giga cow test bed. But what we're not allowed to release is information connecting the genotypes to the traits included in the Nordic Total Merit Index which is an incredibly important database for the largest breeding organization in Sweden, because they have access to unique information about health traits, etc., which is what they sell to the farmers as a service. So what we're trying to do now is to separate what can we share openly to enable technological innovation and what can we, and what do we need to protect? So we want open data. And this is also why several of the largest companies in agriculture in Sweden have teamed up to form Agrinod, which is this open data, which is this data platform for agriculture. It's not open. It's like Ohad said about when it's more along the Ohad, as Ohad said about FAIR that yeah, it's accessible according to agreements. So so we are look, we're going towards having more sharing as long as we know what we can share. 
thank, thank you, Thomas. I uh, coming from the outside, I imagine it's it's sometimes quite tricky to to figure out what what can actually be open that and what needs to be protected. And I guess that's one reason you are filing this application, <laughs> trying to investigate yes. it further. Um, yeah, and I and I'm extremely glad that I went to Uppsala, where that I studied at Uppsala School of Entrepreneurship and ran a company before I went into research. Because because we can do a lot of research as long as we think of our commercial partners and take care of their interests as well. Thank you. Thank you for that note. And I think that's extremely important in the Nordic Testbed Network because here we really want to join forces. We want business, academia and public organizations to come together and work on this. And then, of course, that's crucial to, to understand and respect the different perspectives. Thank you. And, and I have as a final question, I have to ask you, Thomas, this connection to the NHL and the sports statistics, please explain. Uh, uh, the, uh, that connect, uh, so one of the things that I've been doing for the early steps of data analysis is that I am treating the cows in the GigaCow network as elite athletes. So we can, uh, because we can, uh, because Sports is something that a lot of people really like, and we also monitor sports people very, very intensively. So that means that we can see their performance, how it changes with, for example, shift length when playing on ice. And we can actually see similar patterns in uh, dairy cows where, by, based on which, which cows move together and how does that affect productivity. So, there's, so we can actually reuse of course, we don't get the same results, but we can actually, a lot of the data processing, which we do in, for example, in a programming language called R, can be shared between sports, sports analytics and agricultural sciences. Thank you. I, I think that was quite, um, quite a good sort of metaphor or a good way for me at least to understand uh, these kind of questions. And I think it's also sort of thought provoking or, or interesting to think about which kind of, of individuals, if we talk about humans, uh, are we sort of allowed and, and it's okay to monitor this closely and collect data and, and spread. Um, when we talk about professional athletes, it might be one thing. When we talk about drivers in forestry machinery, for example, uh, it might be another thing. And then we have, of course, the animals as well. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, we already spent half an hour in this conversation. Uh, I would really like to thank all three of you for taking the time to be with us here today and to provide your reflections and examples here. Thank you so much. And, and I hope if uh, there's anyone who would like to continue the conversation with Ohad, Thomas, Eric, you could either try to find their contact details or just ask me and I'm happy to provide them. Uh, so thank you so much uh, to all three panel participants. And we will now move on in the agenda. And I hope that the, the conversation and the reflections here from Ohad, Thomas and Eric, and also from uh, Susanne and Chesty earlier, uh, will provide you with some ideas for these conversations. So we're here trying out, at least for me, a new format, and we have opened up different breakout rooms here in Zoom. And this is, of course, all voluntary, but we wanted to sort of image uh, a, a natural physical meeting where you would gather at different tables, having a cup of coffee or a glass of water and discussing things that you find interesting. So the idea here is that you can enter e either of these uh, breakout rooms. And I know that it depends on the version of Zoom and whether you're on the Zoom client or in the browser version, if you can actually enter these rooms by your own force. So for those of you who can enter a room, please go ahead and pick the one you find interesting. And for those of you who cannot, just write in the chat and be a little bit patient and we will help to place you in the room you would like to be in. Um, and as mentioned, this is a, a way for providing you the opportunity to get new contacts, discuss and listen uh, to others talking about these different topics. Uh, there will also be a sort of a moderator, an informal moderator in each of the rooms, but I'm one of them, so also again, be patient, I will, I will join shortly. 
Um, and we also provide uh, this opportunity to, within the Menti uh, tool, um, provide ideas and reflection. This is if you want. Uh, you can enter the menti.com and you see the codes here for the different topics. So if there's any reflection you want to send back to us coordinating the network, then this is a good way to do that. So enter then the Menti page and put in your comments. And by 11.55, I will call everyone back to the main room to say thank you and finishing off with some reflections from the Secretary General of Nordic Agri Research. So please enter the rooms that you find interesting and write in the chat if you need some assistance in entering the room you're interested in. And we will figure out this with joint forces, I'm sure. We have, for example, our Zoom moderator, Ella, who will be helping us in moving people into the right rooms. So let's see if we can make this work. While you're finding your different rooms, I can just keep on explaining a little bit about the different topics. Uh, we touched upon business models, uh, which uh, is connected to things like who provides data, who benefits from it and who pays for it. For it. Uh, technical requirements, we discussed a little bit today, but that's really about system compatibility and capacity levels, connections. Data ethics, which I will join in a moment, is about integrity in some of these questions we just talked about with the Giga Kao and Thomas. And the decision making is a question about who actually makes the decisions on this data and what implication does that have. And then we have the data sharing, which I think we touched upon quite a lot today, uh, which is really sort of with whom do we share the data and what opportunities and risks do we see. So I can see, I'm sure Ella is busy trying to help all of you who would like to join a room and get some help with that. So please just be patient and Ella will transfer you to the right room in a second. You could always check if it's possible for you to join the room by clicking at the different breakout rooms and then if you could choose to join it yourself. Sometimes that works as well depends on the version you have of the Zoom client. And I hope you will all have interesting discussions in your different rooms. And as mentioned, I will call you back at 11.55. Welcome back to the main room. You were quick. I. Uh, I guess maybe you were interrupted in the middle of a sentence, or hopefully you had intensive discussions and uh, perhaps a little bit annoyed that I forced you all back here in the main session. But thank you so much for engaging in these breakout rooms and in these different topics uh, that we prepared. Uh, I look forward to talk to the informal moderators for each breakout room later on to hear about what you have been discussing. Because uh, listening to your ideas, reflection, comments and questions is a very important part of running the Nordic Testbed Network because that, because that gives us an idea of what we should focus upon in the coming events and activities that we uh, conduct. So thank you so much for engaging in those discussions. Uh, we are reaching the aim of this webinar here for today, um, but I would like to ask Per Hansson, Secretary General at the Nordic Agri Research, if you Per would like to share a reflection. What, what do you take with you from this virtual meeting here today? We've been touching upon a range of different questions and issues, but what do you take with you from today? Let's see if we can get Per in the, on the stage. I have not transferred him around to different rooms and let's see if we can find, find the right room for Per. While, while we get Per on the stage, I can just share that 
some of the takeaways for me personally is that we need to talk both about open data and proprietary data. So basically, what can we share and how do we share that? Uh, and what do we need to protect and how do we do that? And I think Shesti gave an interesting example from um, the testbed in Norway um, using bank ID as a way for the farmer to log in to only access her or his own data. Uh, and we also had the opportunity to learn a little bit more about the European Open Science Cloud and the Gaia X. And as I understand it, where Gaia X we have this meeting between or connection between industry and research, which is really what we have within each uh, of our test beds. And we also had the opportunity to learn about the FAIR principles. Uh, now let's see if we have Pa with us. Are you there, Pa? I hope so. Ah, excellent. So what do you take with you from today, Pai? Yeah, I, I, I started out with your uh, goals for today, get inspired and, and learn something. And uh, I think uh, it's been a very interesting day. So, um, and I, I, um, I've, I focused or, or what went up to my, in my mind uh, at this, at the end of this session is, we started out very broad. What is data? And that uh, perhaps it's, it's good to, uh, to uh, take the, a little bit philosophic view on, on what we are dealing with. It's not just numbers and uh, measuring. It's a lot of things. It's pictures and it's, it's uh, uh, d uh, different objects and, and uh, what we write and what we uh, collect collectively collect uh, uh, in our work and in our uh, even in our uh, life at, at large and um, uh, also the uh, connection between cows and nhl and ice hockey it's very very uh, very interesting especially now when thinking back about swedish performance maybe we should uh, connect Giga Cow to the Swedish uh, <laughs> hockey team, uh, uh, getting them to move better together. Uh, also, the thing that 85% uh, of uh, data collected is, is never used, and that is a rising question among pra practitioners also. Uh, we collect a lot of data. Uh, they, they, they see that they collect a lot of data. And they are kind of getting frustrated about uh, not uh, being being able to use use this data in an effective uh, way. Uh, then we went into uh, things like interoperability, uh, both technical and legal, uh, uh, going over then to terms uh, for data sharing uh, and, and frame framework for data sharing. So uh, I think we have had, had uh, got ourselves uh, quite a, a doses of, of, of uh, inspiration and uh, new things uh, to to uh, develop around for the for the future work in this network. So um, thank you, thank you all for par participating in all the speakers that have been uh, joining us today and, and uh, sharing their knowledge and views. So thank you so much for today. Thank you, Per. I think that was a very uh, efficient and nice summary. We started broad. What is that and why should we care? And we ended up with some very specific questions regarding contractual terms and, and how we can understand data in use within the test beds. Thank you so much. I also want to extend a warm thank you to all participants. And just a, a brief notice, if you want to keep up to date, the newsletter is a great way to do that. If you want to get in contact, just give me a call or send an email. I wish you all a nice lunch and thank you very much for today. Bye.